Hey, Jeff Cohn here with another episode of the Team Building Podcast, where we interview top team leaders, broker owners, and thought leaders from across the industry. We are interviewing a mega agent. Uh, He's very well known for his success in expanding across uh, the entire country inside of Keller Williams, um, having massive success, generated over $4 million in net income, ladies and gentlemen, not GCI, $17 million in GCI. 4 million in net last year. This year, they're already going to crush all of those numbers. Uh, I think he mentioned they're already over 30 million in GCI this year, year to date. And we're recording and it's June of 2021. Mr. Adam Hergenrother with the Herg Group out of Vermont. Welcome to the podcast today. Hey, thanks. I, I really appreciate that. And that was some wonderful bragging, but thank you for all that you do. I know how long that it, it takes to put on these episodes and the energy that goes into it and not everyone understands it. So I appreciate the value that you bring into real estate professionals across. We'll say we are uh, not at 30 million GCI yet. We are, uh, we're, we're doing about three to 4 million in GCI a month um, or as we sit right now. So hopefully we'll be above 30 million at the end of the oh, year. Oh, you're in. That's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That'd be, I'd, I'd, if you want, be there, though, Adam. I love you're, you're, 30 million by June, that'd be 60 million. Your trajectory is great. It was funny. So Adam and I were kind of joking around every guest I have on. We talked for about 10 or 15 minutes beforehand to kind of prepare what we want to talk about and how we think we can help serve our audience. And I was asking Adam how old he was, because of course I'm very competitive and I wanted to make sure that he was older than me so I could catch up to all the accolades he's doing. And we did discover he is older than me by three months. So I told him I got three months. <laughs> got to get caught up. Um, Adam turns the big four zero in August. So everyone be sure to wish him a happy, happy birthday. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Excited. How come we didn't talk before? We just kind of stared at each other's eyes for a long time. Usually we just <laughs> we do that before we jumped on the show as part of your tactic. I love it. It's very Yoda style. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on. And it's funny. Um, I always say the difference between you and me and our audience members are the books that you read, the people you spend your time with, and the podcasts you listen to. And I was able to learn so much in this industry by listening to individuals like you um, through the Toby Salgado podcast, Pat Hyben's podcast, which is now Aaron Mukasegi's podcast, um, and a lot of other amazing ones, Josh, uh, Josh Smith. And we were able to dissect those podcasts and then try to implement one thing. So if anyone can get anything out of this today, it is going to be about growth. It's going to be about scale. It's going to be about what you do with your disposable income to create legacy wealth. And Adam is a master. He's one of the top, if not the leading expansion agents in the country. So let's dive right into topic. Adam was just tapped by Inman to write an article in relation to what is expansion? What do mega agent expansion teams look like? How? What's the differentiation between a team and an expansion team, a, a team that expands across the state versus an entire nation? And we're doing the exact same thing at KW Elite. And so I'm really excited to kind of go back and forth and I'll try to challenge Adam on a couple things. So stick around, listen to this episode. It's going to be about 25 minutes of great content. So Adam, dive into topic. Tell us about this article for Inman. Yeah. You know, I, I think right now uh, everyone's paying attention to the, you know, Inman earning news and you're hearing about teams, teams, teams. And it's funny because if you think about it, you know, back when I joined real estate in 2006, I don't know when you got in the, I think the largest team was like, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I, I think the largest team, if you remember, Jeff, I think it was like 30 million, 30, 40 million was like a massive team back then, right? Now I know you know prices went up a little bit, but let's be real. Teams have really, really started kicking into place after 2010 and they've been growing ever since. And now there's this whole conversation around teams. You know, first breaking down, you have this you know, what we kind of refer to as like a team, which would be like, you know, any individual that's a leader that has buyer agents, they may have an admin staff, maybe one or two or three. They may have some, they may have a listing agent, they may not, but I think most people kind of can wrap their arms around what a team looks like from there. Then you have what's called expansion. And it's funny that word, I'm trying to get rid of that word because it's not really describing what's really happening. We just used it back when I first expanded in 2011. You know, I had somebody tell me that day that I expanded that I was going to jail, by the way. Um, it's just funny. Um, just you're not allowed like, to expand. Yeah. yeah. Do you, does, does Gary know what you're doing? Is it? I'm like, yeah, I've been working with him for the last year. Yeah. <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny. And, uh, and so there was obviously a lot of criticism to expansion, but we actually called it duplication back then. Because what I did is I live in Vermont. And if, if you do get anything from this podcast, hopefully you can realize that if I can do any of this, you guys can do it. Um, and I quickly hit uh, ceilings here. We have more um, chickens and cows than humans. So you're we a smaller really... town, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. what, what's your city called? Well, it's Burlington, Vermont. You know, we, and we have, this is an example. We have maybe 400 agents in a three hour radius. Um, so we don't have a tremendous amount and maybe 2000 transactions 
mm-hmm. the entire state. So we, we, you, financially, I was limited, right? And so when, we, when I became the number one agent relatively quick in the state of Vermont, I just kind of woke up and said, well, I need to, I, need, I want something larger, right? Mm-hmm. And not just for me, maybe at the time I was, I was more hubris than I am now, but I, I kind of, you know, maybe I was like, I want to prove the world, right? I can do all this stuff. And, and maybe there's a little of that rah-rah with me a lot more. There was back then with me for sure. Um, and, and hopefully I've learned from that. But, you know, so when I started expanding, the first location I went to, I had to jump states, which was very odd. People just didn't do that inside of brokerage. Now people had multiple brokerages, like right, that are they had in multiple states. But I own multiple brokerages in states, but it's different, right? The 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 team aspect, you know, I didn't have my license. So the first location I went into, I went to Portland, Maine. I didn't have my license. I didn't, you know, I met with the the location leader. We called him a CEO, the location leader, you know, a couple for a couple of days. And he, he came up to Vermont and shadowed me. And then what we did is we just duplicated our current business and dropped it where he was. That's why we called it duplication. Mm-hmm. And I remember, Jeff, the first 90 days that we were in there, and he'd, he'd done about 4 million in, in, uh, in volume when, when we took him on. And then I think in, within two years, he was doing 30, 30 plus million. So we kind of, we knew that that was by 2013, 2014, we knew that that worked, but I remember in, in within 90 days, we were, we were profitable. And I think we, the way our, our, um, uh, our kind of profit margins work, our, our compensation models for our location leaders is they get paid on their deal, right? And they get a split on their deal. And then we split the profits with them. So we're basically partners, right? So if you were to, you and I were to join up, you would be a, the CEO of the location and you would get any deal that you did, you'd get a split on just like any agent would. And then you and I are going to go into business together and you're going to get a percentage of our profits, right? We have three different tiers based on that. So uh, he did. And, and that month, uh, I remember transferring like $10,000 over into my account that month. And I remember that's when I realized like this can work. I had never seen any transactions. I wasn't licensed there. I didn't deal with any clients, right? Because, um, and I didn't deal with any buyers or sellers, or any of that. And I was like, oh, this is something else. So we launched the second one. And the first two went really well. And, um, and, and that was great. And then I started launching the third one, the wheels fell off the bus. Essentially, I, it's like it, we didn't have the proper staff. I didn't have the right systems, models. And it really took probably another four years, Jeff, to really spend and spending millions of dollars, by the way, to figure out the intricacies of how do we scale. And I say, everybody, if you want to, you either you should stay small in expansion, meaning it's an expansion. I'll, I'll define that in a second. Um, really just means that you have a team without any borders, right? It's just, it's not there. And it's just really all you're doing is you're doing what Starbucks does. Right. We wanted to make sure that we had the same experience, whether an agent or you know, a seller was using us or a buyer was using us in Portland, Maine or Vermont or Florida. And what we just wanted to do is make sure that we streamline that process as much as possible for it. And what has developed since, right, since that those initial, you know, duplication models that had happened. And there was a couple other agents right off the bat that expanded with us. And there was about three that hung with us for about six or seven years. And then Keller Williams started pushing expansion. Then Mm -hmm. a lot of people got into it and a lot of people got out of it because they realized how difficult it was. And can I make a quick comment? Absolutely. You made the, you created the parallel to make, or sorry, to Starbucks. And I had been thinking the whole time, like, this is no different than McDonald's found the founder is a really great show, by the way, it's on Netflix. It's It's awesome. Um, great show to show the history and where it came from. Um, the thing that's interesting about the Starbucks parallel, and I don't know if you drew this intentionally, but that is that Starbucks typically lives in grocery stores and airports and all these other places. You don't have brokerage. I mean, you do have some brokerages. Yes. We have a brokerage as well, but expansion typically, as you hear it spoken of traditionally is not ha- owning the brokerages everywhere you go, but having the team inside the brokerage, just like a Starbucks inside of a grocery store or Starbucks inside of a mall. That's exact. That's exactly right. Yep. They, they're right. inside another system so that you, they, you're just paying rent for space. They're taking the insurance. They're taking the, the risk. They're helping you provide systems and models and the liability that's there as well too. And so brokerages they, they go broke, right? Brokerages exactly. go broke. Teams, yeah. you said you're keeping 23% net margin. Yeah. If yeah. you yeah. owned all of these locations as brokerages, <laughs> imagine yeah. you have your, your, your one person. And then how many, how many people are typically on each of these teams? Well, it really depends because we have three different models that we run, but we have as many as 30 agents and as little as four. And we actually are just launching a single agent model, which I can explain at some point. But um, the average, I would say, is about 10 or 11. We want to get people to about at least to a 10 uh, as quick as possible so that there's enough business income coming in every single month to make sure that it's profitable. But economies of scale is difficult if you only have 10 people and it was a brokerage shop. Oh, yeah. And that's what makes this work so well. Um, I know there's a lot of brokers across the country because uh, we have a lot of people that listen to this across hundred brokerage brands. 
and their brokerages don't allow expansion. I know when I was at Berkshire Hathaway, it was very frowned upon. That was one of the reasons we left when Gary and Paul Richardson were recruiting me over to Keller Williams. Keller Williams was like, yeah, come on over and do whatever you want, expand wherever you want. Our offices are very open to it. However, I think the dirty little truth is not all offices are are into it, even though Gary has said you need to accept it. So yeah, that's, 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 that's completely me. true. Yeah. I mean, each office is owned independently, so they can't force you to do what you're doing, but they will certainly do whatever they can from the franchise system to help people expand. And they're doing that more and more right now. How, how does it choices. hurt? How does it hurt an office for anyone listening that's thinking of expanding? What are the negatives for the location that you're thinking about going into? Why would they not want an expansion team to come in? Well, I think, you know, part of expansion took off really fast. And I think a lot of people made a lot of mistakes and caused a lot of issues for market centers. And so that's the one, that is one, and that's true, right? There's definitely people made mistakes. They went in there, they lost agents because of the mistakes they made. You know, it was messy. They didn't have the right systems. They didn't have models. I saw a lot of agents actually trying to expand because they weren't profitable in their current location. Hmm. It was like, yeah, that makes sense, right? I met with an, I met with an Sounds agent. Sounds like how America spends money. Exactly. I met an agent one time who had launched, it was, right, it was probably 2015 or so. And, and there's no judgment on this guy. I mean, he came into my office and said, hey, I need some help. And he was from a different state and he flew. And I said, sure, come in. He had like six or seven locations and there, none of them were profitable. And he's like, if I just go launch another one, I'll just get that one profitable. What am I doing wrong? So I went back to the first location. I said, dude, you, you're not even out of listings and buyers yet. And you've got six other okay. I'm like, this is, you need to go shut all of your teams down. And to his defense, he did. He went actually back. He shut all his teams out and got his core team strong. So that's what I tell everybody before you need to even think about expanding. Have you gotten yourself out of at least buyers? You're doing a few listings here and there before you're going to spend time and energy on actual expansion. Let's make sure that you've maximized. Again, I told the story. The only reason why we expanded was because I had to, because of actual limitations in my, you in reached my marketplace. The ceiling. 2000 yeah. houses a year in, in our Vermont. state. Yeah. Dude, we'll do 2000 in Omaha this year. I know. <laughs> That's I know. Crazy. It's, it is. It is crazy. So, cool story. All right. So um, one of the other things I found fascinating when I asked you about your, how the revenue is generated, this is all based on company dollar. This is based on commissions associated with the sale of real property. That's and why I asked it is I hear of a lot of brokerages and agents and teams that are making a ton of money off the other services you know, that, that a brokerage yeah. would offer or that a team could potentially offer like mortgage services, insurance, um, home inspection, home warranty title, et cetera. Um, up to this point, you're pretty much all the commission income that comes in. What happens in the next five years if the flat rate model wins, uh, the Zillow agent wins, the Redfin model wins, and there's not commission dollar to be earned and you've built this big infrastructure, what's going to be your pivot point? Or do you well, not, you, not assume yeah, that? I, I think happen. you would die at that point. I think you need to pivot way before that. And I think- So what would the be pivot be to survive if, and I always have told my followers that it is going, it's not a question of if it is happening, it is happening. Yes, it's a question yes. of when is it happening? And then what do we need to do to survive? Well, I think you need to own the consumer. I think if you can own the consumer, then you will win out at the end of the day, if, as long as you can provide enough value and service, if you hadn't pivoted to that already. But I think you know the teams of the future, and that's kind of what I was getting at, defining that you have teams, you have expansion, people that have expanded. And then I then I consider like what HRG is and place and a few other, even Redfin. I, I, would, I always consider myself, like I said, people don't know what to do. I say, go look at Redfin. That's what we are. We're Redfin. They just went out and borrowed a whole bunch of money to go start it faster. And we're doing it by making sure that we're profitable. That's the only difference. Um, mm. you know, there was you're using your own money. <laughs> we're using our own money. Using to a bunch this, of right? people. Yeah, exactly. Institutional money. We have a different model too, as well, because we're not paying employees that way. But that's yeah. essentially how we see ourselves as real estate platforms that have HR. We have HR. We have a board of directors. We have healthcare for our agents, for our employees, by the way, and agents. You know, we've got nutritionists. We've got, uh, we handle all the finances. So the person, the people that were on, on uh, that are CEOs in our locations, they have no financial responsibility more. You know, we, we want them basically doing 10% of what they're currently doing. And we're going to save them money. We usually save every team 30% right off the bat because of our, um, our, our economies of scale, save people right. a lot of money of what we can do. People are coming into your systems, just like if you were to join a franchise like Starbucks, you're going to plug into exactly. their systems and they've already figured it out. And you've already failed forward to the tune exactly. of millions of dollars millions. and you've got, you've got it figured out. So yeah. that's exactly. awesome. Well, we've got, we've got to figure it out to today. So sure. now we just keep going. And yeah, yep. it's a, and yeah, I think we, we are in, in, in the next 60 days, I think you'll see some announcements of what we're doing. We'll have, you know, title mortgage insurance those type of things, really owning those components of it as well too. But I think that real estate platform of what you are, that the larger you are that way and the more nimble you are and the more avenue 
avenues you have of income coming in, the easier it is going to be to pivot to whatever it is that you need to be doing. We're working through some pretty creative ways um, that we'll share at some point in time of what we can do to really in, in entice the homeowners to be part of what we're doing too. Of, yeah. Is there a way that you could give them stock in your company when they buy a house from you or something along those lines? So there's a lot of different ways we're trying to be very creative to really change the industry of what that looks like um, so that we can really make sure that we're on the leading edge of this. Um, yep. And that's, I love that's it. part of where we're going. And I know a lot of what um, Adam is sharing, I've heard Gary Keller say this a lot. It, it all comes back to the data and the conversation is around how do you best serve the consumer by the things you offer them when they live in your platform. Um, the Keller Williams platform is command. Um, each brokerage, as I research brokerages to go to, is very interesting to watch which ones actually had a technology platform that they've built from scratch, which ones were playing in the data world. And after doing a lot of research, the only two I saw was Zillow and Keller Williams that were really focused on those two things. And it's okay for today if your whole play is just building your real estate team and selling houses. But in five or six years from now, I think that some people are going to get it themselves, not some people, 95% of agents are going to be in a pickle. And I loved your answer to how to pivot. You don't need to worry today about the pivot, but you do know that the pivot will rely on a really strong data source and the value that you can offer your database. You know, I think that's why you're seeing, you know, $100 million plus teams partnering with these real estate platforms. I think you're doing that because they recognize that, you know, because here's the reality, the industry hasn't changed. Sure, there's been some minor changes, but the industry has not changed, but it's bubbling, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's what I tell everybody. It's like, you think they're like, yeah, the real estate industry has changed. I'm like, changed. The market is different, but the real estate industry hasn't changed much at all. I said, you just, the next two to three years, you're going to see change. And, and that's what, and that's why people are going, you know, I've got, I built this thing up. Let me partner with, with a much larger extent, you know, expansion platform, or just think about as business, business platform. So that when the changes do come, you're not facing this alone. That's why I really think you're going to see a massive consolidation um, amongst agents, either joining teams or teams joining these real estate platforms that we're building so that they can figure out their place in this. And that as we start to pivot, they're pivoting with us and part of this train of changing the industry, going ahead and changing it before we're forced to. When you have to, when you're already on your heels and you're forced to make changes, you have to, you're, you're relying on somebody else to cut you. And I always use this example. It's like, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm going to bleed, I'm going to stab myself and control it. And so that's what I'd rather do. And I'd always take that Gosh, analogy. <laughs> there's the quote, Dana. That's I've exactly. never heard that before. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, you know, I was one of the Where'd first. Where did you get that out? Did you read that? No, actually, you know, I didn't. You know, I was one of the. I actually said it in a market center meeting about three or four years ago. Oh we gosh. were one of the first people to change our market center uh, metrics, financials, and splits to our agents. And people are like, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" I, I, I was on a call and I said, "Dude, if somebody's going to stab me, I'm going to stab myself and control the bleeding." And that's where it came from. <laughs> well, um, I'm seeing people bleed, man. I can't yeah. believe all the traditional brokerages right now losing teams by the millions yeah. of dollars. I mean, it's unreal. They're exiting. You, know, you just saw Berkshire Hathaway Home Service services just lost Chris Stewart to place, which was a huge win for Ben Kinney and a big nod to their organization. They're doing big things. What I see happening is that everyone that has big teams will end up existing inside of Keller Williams. And you'll see a couple other companies that will hang on for a while, but in the end, it'll be at Keller and they will be in organizations like yours and mine and place. And I know the more will come to the market. The conversation you and I are having that I think is unique that I've never heard other people have is in relation to the additional uh, businesses that we can bring in to create multipliers for the real estate transaction, bring more value to the consumer. And that is access to the mortgage, the insurance, the title. Um, You can even take it further to go post-closing services like um, concierge services, security systems, cable, internet, the list goes on and on and on. And brokerages that aren't having these conversations say not necessarily offering the solution, but conversations and building the platform to serve this desire. I think you're going to really see people struggling to have profit margin. Well, they're going to get to a point where it just becomes such a slide that they can't stop it. Uh, and then they're either going to just sell to somebody else for their whatever whatever dollar they, they can left. get in their assets um, yeah. or, or agents that are there. You know, I don't know this for certain, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but I think, you know, the Remax Integra sale, I think you saw that there. And I, um, you know, that Remax International is buying. I actually think it's because part of it is they were they were possibly looking at leaving. Um, and I think they didn't want to, you know, to leave. I don't know that for, I never talked to the owners of it, but I just, or other things. So, sure. but I, I, I think that's pattern. part of, I think that's part of it is you're seeing these big groups wake up and go, Hey, this, this is about the shift. What are we going to do? And people are trying to fight for agents right now and for market share, which really, instead of just the agents, you got to look, turn around and say, 
how can we get large enough so that we can actually invest the millions of dollars that are necessary to make these pivotal changes to actually control not control is the wrong word, to influence the consumer so that they're staying with us. And that's what people need to be thinking about. It's not that they're, um, it's not that we're getting big just to make money. It's a component of it. Sure. But we're doing it so that we can actually get so large that we can, you know, if we want to go raise a bunch of money in PE that we could, or whatever, if we want to partner, we could, whatever we can do, their options are there. Just like Keller Williams is doing right now, right? They, They have three different options. They've been very open about that they're looking to do And the reason why they're doing that is because they need access to capital, right? Because they realize that if billions of dollars are going to be poured in here, we, yes, sure. We're extremely healthy as a private company. We're there, but we don't, we can't go pull, you know, $3 billion out right now to be able to do those things. So they're looking going, what can we do to set ourselves up to have access to capital? And that's the same approach that I'm taking is, well, we need to get so big and we need to start positioning ourselves to make sure that we're in that same position to be able to deliver to our agents, to our consumers, what we need to do by having uh, access to capital or generating our capital so that we can make these pivots and really and not just survive, but thrive over the next three to five years. Dude, I love it. You said a lot of amazing things. This is great content. I know we wanted to talk about spirituality within our business. You've spoken to a lot of the elements of how you bring that to your company. The thing that stood out to me uh, comes from the ideology behind the book, The Dream Manager, mm-hmm. which I know I think Tim Heil's wife is the one that introduced that book to me. Oh, I don't know funny. if you read that before. I, I um, have. It, I have read it, but so it's been a little while. Yeah. It's the concept that it's our job as a leader to help those in our organization realize their dreams. And Gary Keller on his book says, it's not about the money. It's about being the best you can be. I say becoming, it's an action verb because the only way anyone that's listening to us or the people in our worlds are going to change is if we change. The only way you and I change is if we change. And how do we change? the books that you read, the people you meet and the podcast you listen to. And then I love you've proven the willingness to fail forward. The people I've seen in my world and at Keller Williams and beyond that have exceeded all of their beliefs of what they could accomplish. They only were able to do that when they were willing to fail. And you, like you mentioned today, five for five years, you broke it. You just kept breaking it and breaking it and realizing, holy cow, to get to where I need to go, I'm going to have to do this a totally different way. And then that didn't work. And you had to do it a different way again, but there was no one you got to follow Adam. You could make every excuse in the book. Well, there was no road book roadmap. You defined it for the Keller Williams organization and the entire country. And no one else, you're not going to say this about yourself, but everyone watching that's paying attention can say it about you and Ben Kenny and Tim. And, you know, there's a handful out there that are paving the way for us. And I'm grateful for a brokerage like Keller Williams, who's allowing us to expand inside of it. Cause they don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Like they could say, Nope, we're not going to do that. They could see it as a, from a scarcity mindset and not allow it, but they're saying, Hey, go do it. And they're showing most of the locations, how it can be a value add for them and why they should support that growth. So if your broker is not allowing you to expand, you definitely need to ask yourself, why would they not allow that? Why would they not you know, subscribe to an abundance mindset? Well, that's fear, right? And I think you're seeing that. Even you see that inside KW with some of some of the people that are leading here too. Is they 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 have something and they don't want it to change. Their their income is 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 matching their expectations for their livelihood, and so they don't want anything to change. And that's a that's nope. a dangerous place to be in mm. because you 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 end up um you end up behind the boat and and you're gonna it's gonna be a it's gonna be a you're wash changing out. no matter what. You're always going up or you're going down. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and you know, it's spirituality too. You know, people get lost and think it's like a religion or passivity and all this stuff. And I just basically break that down and say, you know, spirituality is when you wake up one day and realize that there's a lot more to life than you. <laughs> and for me, I had to learn that the hard way. I was when I was building my organizations, I was extremely hubris and I thought the world should bow down to me. And I was like, look what I did in Vermont. Like I'm making a half million dollars a year. I remember that. Yeah, I'm like exactly, yeah, exactly. And I'm bowing uh, to him for those listening. This is like <laughs> deep bowing to Adam. Oh, look at you. In the Can I share something thing, really quick? I just yeah, shared yeah. this with my dad at lunch today. That's where I came from right before this. Um, I believe it was Stanford. Correct me if I'm wrong, people, but I believe Stanford did a um like a thesis and they did a huge survey of over a thousand CEOs trying to determine what the number one quality they found was similar across all CEOs that dominate. I think you see CEOs that make over a million a year. And the thing that they found was it was essentially self-awareness. Yeah. And to your point, spiritual maturity, yes. um, an awareness that there's a world bigger and being willing. I think the biggest thing is know your strengths, but more importantly, know your weaknesses, be willing to admit them and then find people to help you fill in the gaps where, you know, you can't fill them in. Yeah. A great way to start is really, there's two things that I do every day. Number one is when I walk into a meeting or walk into any situation, I'm always reminding myself, am I walking in here to be right? Or am I walking in here to find a solution? And the majority of the time, most people are walking in there to be right. 
and they don't want to find a solution. They want their solution to be what they think <laughs> instead of actually finding a solution that best fits the organization or the consumer or the agent or the employee. I also, every time when I show up in my office or you get into your, your, your office at your house, whatever it is, I just do a gentle reminder of myself and just say, hey, I am here to contribute. I'm not here to get anything from anybody. Most people walk in and say, what do I need my agent to do? What can I get from them? What can I get from my employee? And so I just do a gentle reminder throughout the day of just like, hey, if you didn't realize we're all going to die, we're here for a split second in the, in the history of the fact that the world is almost 5 billion years old, right? We're here for just a hair. It's not, <laughs> it's we're not, not going to die, do- dude. They're download. They're going to download our brains into computers. Well, we're that's good. a whole we're conversation good, we can have about the AI we're components good. of those things. But like, it's, <laughs> it's like, but your, your, your physical, like we're, we're at some point not going to be here and that's, that's fine, but you need to wake up and realize that, then, then why am I here? And that's what I, that's all I mean about spirituality is like just asking bigger questions in your life so you can get bigger answers. So then you can go out there and live bigger. Love it, man. Could, couldn't have said it better. And I agree a hundred percent and people are lazy um, and aren't willing to ask themselves, what's the life look like that they need to live. Yeah. And then how could Adam Hergenrother or the Herd group be a solution to that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we, we even tell our own people, if you don't think that KWE or, and, or any of the ancillaries you work for are going to lead you to live and lead the best life, go find someone else. That's going to help you do that. Don't just follow us and be miserable. Go find someone else, go find a different spouse. That's going to make you happy, but it's all obviously a choice. You know what it is? It's it's safer to ingest other people's answers instead of being having courage to go out and find your own. So most people that I've that I experience just want to adopt somebody else's viewpoints and beliefs mm. instead of critically thinking to ask yourself, is that truly what I think or did I just adopt that because it's easy? And and I have three kids under nine, and one of the things that I really focus them on through our training is that I don't ever want them to take what I tell them for truth. I want them to take what I what I say and then explore it go self-inquiry with it and then see what you arrive for the answer. And there's a whole bunch of tactics. We can talk about things that we do for our kids and just for our employees that same way. But life is not about just ingesting an answer. It's really about getting able, being able to critically think for yourself. And I think that's what influence is, right? Is influencing is being able to showcase other people of how to get what they want when they want to get it. Um, and I think that's the, that's the same way. But they have to be able to come to their own conclusions because the reality is whether you believe me and you or you don't believe me and you is irrelevant. It's not, that's not what we're here for. We're here to in the podcast and the, and the data that you put out there is designed for you to go, Hey, you know what? Maybe I should do it differently. It's designed to spark an inquiry so that you go in inside and reflect on it and then come to your own conclusions. They may happen to be ours. They may not. That's irrelevant. But if we do our job, it's to spark that initial conversation that you get to have with yourself. Everyone's got that little voice and then figure out what the best alternative for you, not for anybody else. I love it. And it's interesting as you share this, I've never had this dialogue with someone on a podcast before. I don't care what conclusion someone comes to. All I care is that they come to a conclusion. If that ends up aligning with mine, awesome. Let's chat about it. If it ends up where it doesn't awesome, let's chat about it. And I'm in a position of abundance. So I'm just here to help people. And I know you're the exact same way. Our guests don't get paid to come on. I don't get paid to host this. It actually costs a lot of money and a lot of our time. (laughs) And we do it as a big give. And it's been an amazing way for me to be able to connect with people like you, Adam, and other influencers across the country, which of of course, in turn, helps me become a better leader and helps me serve the people in my world. How does somebody get in touch with you? How does someone apply to be in your world if they want to try to be a Herg contact in another city? Do they have to join Keller Williams to do that? No, they actually don't. Um, we're working on that right now. Um, we're, we're actually doing it so that if people don't want to necessarily be inside Keller Williams, we have options for that as well too. Um, yeah. But you know, you can go to adamhergenrother.com, adamhergenrother.com. We also have a podcast called Business Meets Spirituality. If you like what we're talking about here, um, there's a, we, you can more than welcome to go there and just get a flavor and you may listen to an episode and go, dude, I don't know what that guy's talking about and I don't like it. I'm out of here. Or you may enjoy it more and, and there's a bunch of ways that we can connect from there. All right. Perfect. And Hergenrother. Uh, H-E-R-G-E-N-R-O-T-H-E-R. You're going to find him even if you misspell it. He's all over the place. Huge <laughs> influence in Keller Williams and outside of it. And I think you probably are the number one expansion agent in the country, um, at least one of the top two or three. So yeah, yeah. Doing yeah. Really we're, cool we're excited team. about what we're doing and pioneering. And I've got a lot of wonderful, wonderful people that are around me that make me look really good. I always tell people like, sure, it's, it's our name on there, but the reality is, it's way bigger than me. And I have a lot of people that just, if, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. Oh, that's awesome. And I'm in obviously in the same boat. Um, when I'm your age, I want to be where you're at. <laughs> you're doing 
<laughs> you doing big things, man. It's awesome. Um, and as my guests listen to this, it's so cool because a lot of what you've talked about the, uh, you're doing is exactly the path we're on and we're probably a few years behind you. And so I'm going to continue to have you back on our podcast and we'll continue to ideate around this and look at the different pitfalls. And it'll be fun to watch all this come to fruition. All these guesses that we have, we'll get to watch this all play out over the next 30 years and probably two to three in certain aspects. Um, I do want to invite all of our guests to come. Uh, we have a virtual workshop coming up in July, and then we have an in-person in September in Omaha, Nebraska, a team building workshop. For more information about those, you can just go out to EliteRealEstateSystems.com, click on events. And then of course, we have our team leader coaching product. It is 50% off for the next three months. So if you want more information about the team leader coaching, which also coaches your individual agents, there's topical and dialogue. And we just added investor coaching. Uh, for all the information about that, go out to EliteRealEstateSystems.com. Dot com. Adam Hergenrother, thank you so much for coming on the yeah, show today. That was awesome. We'll definitely want to have you back on. Awesome. Glad to be here. All right. Take it easy.